Yeah, this is uh, Ethan Pinch of The New House, and I'm you know, very happy to be talking to you uh, today, Dan, about this uh, new book of yours. And, uh, and um, you know, for people who are listening who are perhaps unfamiliar with your work, uh, Dan Schneider is um, uh, an author, poet, critic, perhaps our greatest living author, which is a bold claim, uh, maybe a little ostentatious, but in Dan's case, it's uh, entirely appropriate and would not sportingly deserve. I mean, no other writer, to my mind, has dedicated himself so fully to his craft and with such results. Um, while still relatively a quite niche figure, where other artists have languished in obscurity, Dan has flourished, moving from strength to strength, from novel to play to... And now we've got um, uh, his first novel since um, uh, Nevels, I believe, Dan. This is the first proper novel uh, since that. Um, you've been doing plays in the meantime, right? Yeah, I did levels the end of uh, 2020 and the end of 21. I guess I, by your intro, I guess I should be flourishing in obscurity. <laughs> Flour flourishing, flourishing is good. I'm not like I'm a obscurity ain't such a bad thing when you're flourishing. But um, this is this is um, the first novel since Nevels, and it's it's a kind of erstwhile follow up to what, what some call your magnum opus, which is the New York um, quartet. And um, can you can you talk a bit about what made you made you back to, to sort of writing this book and sort of returning to New York and the little Linguini and these characters? So what how did that come about? Well, the New York Quartet is four books that uh, follow a character named Manny Cole, who is my one of my many doppelgangers within my works. Uh, but that sort of came to an end with my book sixty four, which wrapped up a lot of the. Uh, major ties of the, the major figures there. But uh, through a few other works, I've mentioned some of these other characters. For example, uh, in my spy novel, there's mention of uh, Joey Greco, who's one of the major characters, one of the two major characters in this book. Uh, then I have mentioned Big Frank and Bit von Rheingold and Pauli Maravelli here and there. In a book I did four, three years ago, Noir Kid, Pauli Maravelli has a few scenes. Uh, with the wrestler Gorgeous George. And I think my next novel, probably at the end of this year, is probably going to be another no uh, wrestler, wrestler novel on a guy named Superstar Billy Graham. But it, it may or may not be, it may be just a loose trilogy if I end up doing three wrestler novels. But uh, uh, then I did, uh, after Noir Kid, uh, I did, no, Noir was not, did I do Noir? Noir Child? Uh, no, Noir Kid. And then I forget what, no, I think I might have done, either I did Noir Noir Kid before The Custodian's Bitch or after, but then after a couple of the shorter novels, I did Levels, which was a longer book, uh, which is about a, a guy, another one of my doppelgangers, sort of lost in some sci-fi predicament, or maybe it's a psychological predicament, or maybe it's a fantastical predicament. Uh, and so in doing that, I wanted to get grounded. And just as with, I had with the Vincetti brothers, for 20 years before I wrote the book, The Vincetti Brothers, I wanted to do a book on the real life uh, people behind the Vincetti Brothers, and it didn't come to me for 20 years. And ever since I finished the New York Quartet, I did want to expand out on this character called uh, Sally T, who I first wrote mm -hmm. about the, the real Sally T in my uh, True Life memoirs. And then he appears as a minor moth figure in uh, assorted short stories and, and longer books here and there. But I wanted to, since he was probably the most connected guy that I knew who actually knew me by name, and he helped get me out of this thing called the company where I was working after four years. He first got me mm -hmm. in and then got me out. Uh, I always wanted to write something with him in it. And you toss ideas around in your mind here and there. And uh, it, it didn't really come to me until I thought, well, let me, let me take the Joey Greco character who appears mm. first in the Vincetti brothers as sort of the sidekick to the character of Gino Vincetti. Then he appears in the spy novel as the day boss in the 1990s of the Maravelli fam fam crime family, meaning that he was the nominal head, but he was really more of a figurehead as Big Frank was in the back. And he has two or three really good scenes in that book. And I said, well, let me put him in charge of the Maravelli family. And he's the guy who tanks the Maravelli family and ends up busting mm. it. Um, and so you have, so I had these two ideas of the story of, of Sally T and of Joey Greco. Mm -hmm. And just like I did with, uh, with, uh, uh, 
the what was it the uh, which book? Oh, was it Noir Kid? Uh, yeah, with Noir Kid, I, mm. I had one one of the major characters, the wife, going uh, forward in time, and I think the wrestler, Gorgeous Sword, is going backwards in time. But I actually had that idea of doing that for this book first, and I sort of did a test run in the earlier book. So here, I want I, I take the Joey Greco character from mm. 2022 back to 1984, and then I take the Sally Trangese, Tra Sally T character from 57 to 84. And the book ends in 1984 with both of their perspectives mm. on a random event, seemingly random event. Now they knew each other mm. here or there, but they don't get sort of officially tied uh, until the, the very end. Yeah, the, I mean, there's a lot of characters down that recur sort of throughout your novels, and sometimes appear quite unexpectedly. So, you know, arguably, all your novels could be simply taking place in the same fictive universe, if you will. Um, but but there's something about kind of this kind of um, this sort of a gang the, the story of all these gangsters. I mean, a bit of a general question here, but what is it about about gangsters in particular? I don't get the sense that you. Um, you know, you're setting out to you admire, or you know, you want to romanticize gangsters. But surely there must be some sort of appeal there. Like, what is it about gangsters that you? Why why do you keep writing these guys? You know. Well, I mean, uh, I I did uh, the spy novel. I've done some sci-fi stuff. Um, before that, I mean, I I did uh, some stuff that had a little fantasy in it. Uh, I did a, mm -hmm. a book called The Scorpion Swam about uh, this Chinese American kid who's another doppelganger of mine who's going through a very uh, uh, Fellini like uh, crisis in his life at a party. Oh, uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, but as far as like the big novels, I guess I guess it's simply because number one, uh, the 20th century, which I was born in and spent the first 35 years of my life in, was one mm -hmm. where the gangster was the American outlaw mm -hmm. um if i had been born a century earlier i would have probably been writing cowboy uh, or uh an indian yeah. novels although i do have a western novel but uh uh and so the fact too that uh, i grew up in that area so it's kind of easy and i've never been particularly satisfied with whether it was you know the godfather which is you know american mafia gone shakespeare which it, in mm -hmm. the first film, especially, uh, he does very well, Coppola. The second film is also pretty good. And the third film, eh. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. Scorsese stuff uh, has a place, but it's also kind of fictionalized, romanticized. Um, there's a, uh, it, it's sort of like neo hip hop cool. Uh, Scorsese was neo hip hop cool before neo hip hop cool was. Uh, and yeah, I, I and it's, it's, also, it's also the sort of problem, problem with uh, Simulacra, isn't it? Kind of eventually people start copying other gangster films and then even even gangsters start copying gangster films as you know pointed out in sopranos and what have you but you know you bring up this point about gangsters being almost emblematic of um, the 20th century you know they're, they're a kind of quintessentially 20th century figure and they and we find kind of in this book um uh, the grand and glorious well we kind of uh, we're brought right up into the the into the modern into the modern era we're brought right up into 2020 2021 um in uh, this sort of place where gangsters are, well, although there's more gangsterism that goes on and so on and so on, it seems like a kind of anachronistic figure. And this is something I almost got the sense of with kind of the New York quartet, that um, um, that there's almost this sense of um, unease, that, you know, that everything's changing and like, um, uh, and, it, and, it, and it makes me think kind of like how these gangsters sort of compare one generation after another, how um, uh, Joey Greco obviously compares to Big Frank and how Big Frank of course, compares to Pauline Maravelli. Can you talk a bit more about that, kind of the differences between these gangsters? Do they represent um, different eras, so to speak? I mean, again, it's a rather general question, but um, surely there must be a kind of generational difference, sort of, um, uh, as we're seeing these criminal gangs go from, uh, pass from hand to hand. Well, yeah, the, there is a difference within the gangsters in the book and in real life, but most importantly, within the book, if you remember, a year or so ago mm -hmm. when we talked about uh, the prior book, Levels, uh, I talked about how that mm -hmm. character, Tom Alden, was living sort of as if he was going through a, a, an assortment of TV episodes, whether it was the Twilight mm -hmm. Zone or the Prisoner type thing. Yes. And instead mm -hmm. of giving the scenes 
where where we have the hero battling the villain or whatnot. Oftentimes, I'd have a chapter start of with, with Tom Alden coming back from a village, say, and, and saying, oh, you mm -hmm. know, we just had an adventure, and now he's talking about it. Yeah. In the same way, yeah. the scenes in this book are different than in the Vincetti Brothers and the Norwegian and the Family. In there, you got to see all, of, that, all of the little machinations. Uh, you, you, got to, you, you get to see the, the violence and image. Whereas here, uh, we're more or less talking about violence and about things that happened. It's in the past. There are two scenes, for example, in the Greco, mm. uh, on the Greco side, where Joey Greco uh, is first tortured by some uh, some uh, government officials, and then later, or, or he's tortured, and then earlier he's he's the torturer trying to get information, and he eventually gets mm. replaced. That there's actually two Joey Grecos. There's the real Joey Greco, and then there's yes. a fake Joey Greco who we don't really know what his real name is. We just get bits and snippets of his past, and then on the on the Sally T side. For example, I took the Limey trope of the great film called The Limey that I recently uh, rewatched yes, yes, the show yes. on, where I have someone coming back into Joey, uh, into Sally's life, and Sally uh, wants to kill him. And then all of a sudden, the character of my doppelganger in the book called Little Danny, Little Danny, L I L, L I, yeah, yeah. Little Danny, uh, somehow miraculously shows up at just the right moment. In, in a movie kind of way to say, no, Sally, you're wrong. Don't kill this guy because this happened. It was all a setup because of this. And so, so just it, it, that moment, for example, in that Sally T thing where he doesn't kill the guy who he thinks killed, not his real son, but a kid that he helped raise with a girlfriend uh, is the kind of thing that to me is more interesting than going through all those machinations. Now I could have done that things. I could have done the same thing, approach these incidents in the lives of, Joey Greco and Sally T in the same ways as I did in the Manchetti brothers and a Norwegian and the family. But why would I do that? I already did that. Well, we know what's mm -hmm. going to happen. And if you know the genre, it's like, if you know, cowboy films with John Wayne, you know, John Wayne is going to swoop in at the end. So if you, if let's say I was directing a film about the making of a John Wayne film, I would probably try to do it in a meta way that the director of a particular mm -hmm. film would try to deconstruct, why do I have to do John Will, John Wayne films all the same way? And in the same way, you don't want to do everything. I mean, there's plenty of violence, there's talk of violence, there's, there's stuff, but it's more interesting for me to talk about characters like there's a father and son in here called the Dreamers, Tommy, Sclafani, Junior, yeah. and Senior, who are basically a couple of not too bright guys who, who occasionally say interesting and intelligent things, but who are always looking at the clouds. 